also served as the chairperson for the Hispanic Organization for Leadership and Achievement. In addition to all of this, was the GM for Respiratory Systems in Care Fusion from 2011 to 2017, and then served as present president for Ansel Healthcare. Um, you guys, I could go on and on and on, but I do think it's important to note his original sort of base of education that led him into some of these positions. He holds a BS in electrical engineering, an MS in engineering management, and is a graduate of the Department of Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. Uh, it's also very important to note he is a member of the Latino Corporate Directors Association and the National Association of Corporate Directors, where he holds the governance fellow designation. Okay, Tony, we have teed you up. You are impressive on paper, and I know you're about to be impressive and delightful in this presentation as well. And I do want to remind everybody, if you have any questions at all that come up, please don't be shy about posting them in the chat. I'll be taking notes here as we speak. And, and as I do, I'll make sure to save those for the end of the presentation when we all get a chance to chat with Tony. Okay, we're ready for you, Tony. Take it away. Jenny, you, you have built me up to the point that I'm now a little afraid. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, it, it always is humbling to hear it when somebody goes to the bio and you go, you know, that, that's that's pretty nice to hear it. Uh, my mom, who unfortunately has passed away some, some years ago, is looking down from heaven. And I just hope that she's looking down because a side note on the book, she's the cause of all the books. One day I'll have to tell you that story, but she's the reason any of the books exist um, is because mom said, get it done. And before she passed, and I was able to get the first one done, dedicated to her and handed to her prior to her passing. So that's the reason any of this has ever <laughs> happened. So I'm hoping she's looking down and saying, well done, boy, keep keep it up. Um, but but look, I'm excited to spend the next you know hour with, with this group. I cannot see the chat, but, but Jenny can. So please feel free to uh, interact on the chat. She'll interrupt me. Feel free to, if you can, I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but if you can, go ahead and belt out your question or your comment, because I like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, you get me started talking about leadership, and Jenny's going to have to pull the reins at about 4.30 to say, hey, remember, we want to leave enough time to really have a conversation with the audience and talk about whatever's on your mind. Because the, the subject of leadership is one that I've been passionate about ever frankly since I was a cadet in the Air Force. But it's it's one that it's a journey. And as part of the journey, what I wanna do is present it to you today some ideas about what I think are the most important traits of leadership and create this new character that I've called Legacy Woman. It could also be Legacy Man, by the way. But why legacy woman? Why why legacy man? Because because we can learn from some of the contemporary superheroes of our day to really try to gather what we think are the most important traits, those traits that are sort of agnostic to sector, agnostic to the business you're in, agnostic to the stage of your career, agnostic to many things, but are really transcend all of that. They transcend whether you're in the banking industry or in the whether for profit or not for profit, whether you're in the government or whether you're in the private sector. These are what I think are the fundamental traits we need, especially in these days, our leaders to possess. But I will tell you, uh, although, like Jenny said, I've written a number of leadership books, they're not Shakespearean. They're written by an engineer who English is a second language because I'm from Puerto Rico. So, but they're written humbly and from the heart. And I think they have some interesting principles. However, that said, nothing new has been written. As I mentioned to Jenny when we were prepping for this, nothing new has been written about leadership for 3,000 years since Sun Tzu wrote his book, The Art of War. And people say, what do you mean by that? Well, let me prove it to you in a, in a somewhat humorous way. So there's a number of books out there that many of you will be familiar with. There's a whole series of one minute manager books. The one minute manager meets the monkey. The one minute manager balances his work and life. Of course, there's the, uh, the Art of War by Sun Tzu. There's the, the one minute manager and, 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 uh, and, and the leadership. There's the one minute entrepreneur. And I'm looking at a different screen. So I have two screens in my office going on. There's self leadership in the one minute manager. There's, there's the one minute entrepreneur. There's the fourth secret. And when I had a chance to ask Dr. Ken Blanchard, the author of all of these wonderful books at his home in California, where I had the chance to be an overnight guest and, and was mentored by this dear man who is the guru of leadership and management of our era. And I got a chance to sit with him and be under his tutelage for, for a few days at his home 
amazing. And I said, well, what happened to sequence one, two, and three? He goes, uh, I got around to him later on. Then there's a one minute salesperson, God forbid. All these books are intended to be comical in their title, but they're really fundamental principles that are not really new, but we don't always apply them like we should. There are also books like, you know, the, the one minute, the, the, the leadership pill. Because when all else fails, what do we do? We, we, we take a pill, right? Empowerment, finally something takes more than a minute. Finally, we find something. And then of course, there's a whole seven habits of highly effective books, right? We are all pretty familiar with those. Unless you have a teenager, then you know they need a special book, a highly effective book for teenagers. And then, by the way, Dr. Covey, just like Dr. Blanchard decided, oh, wait, I forgot, there's one more habit. There's the eighth habit. So, so there's all these other great little books, Managing from the Heart, a book that fundamentally changed the way I manage people. And I learned about this book more than 30 years ago. Hero and Zach, the five dysfunctions of a leader, the five dysfunctions of a team, Leadership 101 by Maxwell, Secrets from Attila the Hun, Who Stole My Cheese, Who Moves My Cheese, Fish. I mean, all of these great little gems of books. None of these books, none of them take more than a few hours to read. But they give you fundamental principles and gems that if you apply them in your life, if you apply them in the way you lead, in the, apply them in the way you interact with each other and with people who report to you or you report to, I promise you, you'll be more successful. These things are fundamental, but they're not new. What would be new is applying the principles. That would be a novel idea. Right now, if this guy here reminds you of your boss or someone that you've dated or someone that you're currently working with, Maybe the books for you are written by yours truly. I've written a series too, including, like Jenny said, the, the Leader's Lobotomy, right? Which is my fun way of saying, what ought we not forget as we climb the corporate ladder of leadership? My point on doing this is to warm you up and let you know that what we're about to talk about, you're gonna go, Tony, really, that's the best you got? That's not new, that's not fresh, that's not fundamental. And I'm gonna say to you, well, actually it is if you apply them. But unfortunately, we see, sadly, too many examples of leadership not applying these principles. And we can all have a debate, a very interesting one, not today, another time, in our political discourse and see where we fall short, or even in the public arena, where we see some leaders who are either political leaders or government leaders or they're country leaders or corporate, big corporate leaders, and we can see the failures of them because they're the most the most celebrated are the failures. Unfortunately, we don't see the great successes, which by far, by far, the leaders we have are usually good ones. But we don't celebrate those. We get to hear about the failures, right? So today, what I want to do is take you to what I think are those fundamental traits. But I want to do it with you. I don't want to do it in a vacuum of you. So what I want to do is ask you a question. And right now, please start the chats right now and start telling Jenny. And Jenny, read them off if you see them. What do you think? are the greatest traits of leaders. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Tell me what words come to mind as you think we need of leaders. What do, what do you think? What words come to mind? Say it. Go ahead. Set an example. Do the work. <laughs> act as if you're expecting everybody else to act. That's what I think of first. Right? I When I ask live audiences about it, and keep reading them off, Jenny, as they come up, what I ask live audiences, I hear all kinds of words. I hear they want creative thinkers. I hear they want people who are motivational and inspirational. I hear that they want people who are, well, I mean, I can keep going and going and going on the words, on the words that are used. And oftentimes there's so many descriptors that we put on leaders that I got to tell you, the person that I come to mind to think of is this guy right here. It's Superman or Superwoman. Well, the good news is, we can try to become like him. The bad news is he don't really exist. And so we can't really find a leader that embodies all of the traits that you may be thinking about when you think about leaders. There's so many ways that I've heard. I've, I've done a presentation in front of literally hundreds of people. And when I've asked this question, the words just keep coming of descriptors after descriptors after descriptors after descriptors. And I go, wow, we just can't find somebody who has all of those. But let's do this. Let's learn from a few superheroes what the most important ones are. So let's start with this guy right here. Let's start with the great trait leaders, the great, the, the, the greatest traits of leaders, and let's start with Superman. You tell me. Again, put them on the chat or hollow them out, or you, Jenny, you tell me what you think they are. What do we know about Superman? What do you remember about Superman? 
What are his traits? What are his qualities? What can he do? Amazing cape, first of all. Amazing cape. Great yes. wardrobe. Um, yes. The group is saying vision is important. They want a leader with vision. They want a good communicator, um, uh, integrity. <laughs> they want someone who's open-minded, honest, free-thinking, inclusive. Look at that. Yeah. Um, not mediocre. <laughs> those are great words. And again, when we think about all of those, you go, wow, can we, and I can add communicator. I can add, I can add a lot of words to those. But with Superman, we can talk about faster than speeding buildings, can leap tall buildings in a single bound, can, can run faster than a locomotive, all the fun things that we've seen in all the movies. But he has one thing that somebody already mentioned that nobody else has. No other superhero has the one trait he has, and that is his X-ray vision. And that's where leadership begins. It begins with having a vision of being able to engage your followers in that vision and getting, getting them motivated and believing in that vision and being aligned with you in that vision. Because when John F. Kennedy in 1963 said, or 1961 said, we should commit ourselves to put a man in the moon and return him safely to the earth. And he said that in Congress, in front of Congress, and in front of the American people in 1961, this iPhone has more technology in, in it than all of NASA had in 1961. So for him as a leader to say, let's put a man in the moon. Oh, by the way, bring him home, bring him home safely. That was a vision that he had no idea how to accomplish. It was a stretch vision, but it motivated an entire nation so that on July 20th of 1969, long after he died, we heard those famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. That would have never happened had John F. Kennedy not had the vision to say, let's put a man on the moon and bring him safely to the earth, right? So that's the first thing. And of course, we also think of character and integrity. For me, those are the two non-negotiables of a leader. Everything else I'm gonna talk about, negotiable. If you're not a good communicator, hire a coach. If you don't know numbers really well, hire a good CFO. But your character and your integrity, those are your own. That's in your DNA. I cannot teach you those things. And if you ever violate those things, those principles, then you're never gonna be as effective a leader as you could have been. So your character and your integrity, for me, are the two non-negotiables. And I usually associate those with Superman because he was always called the goody two-shoe, right? Not always, but always. Okay, so now that you understand the game, let me show you the second character, Wonder Woman. Now, what words, put them on the chat for Jenny to read out. What words come to mind? And Jenny, what do you remember about Wonder Woman? What, do, what comes to mind? What, what can she do that you remember about her? I really wish I would have studied up on my superheroes prior to this presentation. I'm <laughs> back to the movie. I'm like, what did she have? Was she just really strong? Was she really brave? So all, all, listen, all the guys who are a little bit older right now on the call are thinking about Linda Carter, the original Wonder Woman, right? Now look, what Wonder Woman could do, she's strong, she's fast, she's got, she's got those shields that she can block bullets, she's got an invisible airplane, the woman has an invisible airplane. She is an Amazonian strong woman who can do all kinds of great things, but she has one trait, one thing that no other superhero has. Anybody guessing what it is? Has anybody put the word true? We are still chatting about the last one. People are saying they want a boss that can admit he or she is wrong. Oh, that's coming. Who's coming. That's We're still coming. talking about that. I promise you that's all coming. But, but she has a truth lesson. And when she lassos you with that truth lasso, you have no choice. You're compelled to tell the truth. And that's the second trait we need in a leader. We need a visionary, truthful, incredible leader. We need a man or woman of character and integrity who is truthful. All right, let's keep the game going. The next character that comes to mind when I think of a leader is this guy right here. Now, I'm a little fond of Captain America for some obvious reasons, having served in the same rank as the captain. Uh, but what words come to mind? And people usually say he's strong, he's fast, he's got that wonderful shield that he do all kinds of things for with. But the one thing he is, more than anything else, Captain America is loyal. Captain America is loyal to the mission. He's loyal to the country. And what I need of a leader is I need them, him or her, to be loyal to whom? To me, to the organization, to what they lead, not to themselves, not a selfish leader, not a self-centered leader. No, I need one that focuses on my needs, on my, my well-being, because the, the sort of the whole idea of creating a better world 
That's what leaders should aspire to in whatever area they lead. So we want a visionary, truthful, loyal, and then we have these four characters right here. Now, who can't remember the Fantastic Four? The Fantastic Four have Mr. Fantastic, who is the rubber guy. He's got the Invisilady, right? She can create all sort of force shields around her and become invisible. You got the fiery guy who's the torch, and you got the thing, hard as a rock. Now, what are the four things that we can learn from these, from these characters that we want our leaders to be? Well, I'll cut to the chase. I'll tell you the answer. We want them to be flexible. We want them to be transparent. We want them to be fiery, fiery in the passion that they have. And we want them to be thick skinned. We want, we need leaders who are going to be strong enough to take the bullets, take the hits, let it bounce off, get back in the game, re-engage. We need fiery, passionate leaders, leaders that engage us and motivate us and excite us and get us all fired up. But we want them to be transparent in their communications, honest and clear, not in double talk, not in, in sort of what, what did that leader mean when they said that? If you listen to some of our politicians and you go, what did they mean? Then they're not being transparent. They're not being honest, completely transparent. And that's what I want in my leaders, complete transparency. And I need them to be flexible, not stubborn in their positions. Hopefully you're getting the point that if you can remember Superman with vision and Wonder Woman with, with, uh, with the truth and credibility and Captain America with loyalty. And you can remember these four characters, flexibility, transparency, fiery passion, thick skin. Those might be some of the words that you used when you described the leader. So let me give you the next one. Who doesn't know Iron Man? I mean, come on. Now, you may not be really fond of Tony Stark, the guy behind the mask, because he's a little self-centered. And that's not my, my cup of tea. But he has the billion dollars, and he is a breakthrough thinker, which is what I need in a leader. I need a leader who understands how to use technology, how to enable technology, how to use resources to bring about technological advancements, right? In whatever field they're in, in whatever field they're in, to be breakthrough thinkers, whether you are in the most fundamental of industries, making widgets one at a time, in a manual operation, or whether you're in the highest of tech technology fields using the latest automation, breakthrough thinking, there's always a creative new way, better way to reinvent what we do. And we need our leaders to be pushing the thresholds on that, right? The next thing I want of my leader is embodied in this guy. And I grew up wanting to be this guy, uh, you know, the Batman or, or, or Batgirl, right? But Batman, I really, this was, this was the guy for me. This was the guy for me. I wanted to be him. And what was it about Batman that was so special? I will tell you, he had that gadget belt around his waist. And he had all the tools, whatever he needed to get out of trouble, he could innovate his way out of anything. And I want leaders who are innovative. I want leaders who, they don't have to carry on that belt or wear the cape or the mask, but I want them to think in innovative ways. I want them to be open to innovative ideas. I want them to encourage and create an environment around them where innovation can happen, can really blossom because they enable it, they encourage it. They don't punish risk takers, they reward them so that innovation can occur. That's the kind of leader I'm looking to be. That's the kind of leader you should be. That's the kind of leader we all want to follow, right? Now, this character here is a new one. You may not be familiar with this one, and many of you, unless you're Puerto Rican, you may go, what? Who is she? Right? Well, this is La Borinquena. La Borinquena is a very recent character. She's only a few years old, actually. And she was created, and I ascribe to her a very important trait in a leader. To me, La Borinquena is about an intelligence called cultural intelligence. We need culturally intelligent leaders. We need them to understand who they are, where they're from, how they show up, and how they can interact with others of different cultures or different backgrounds or different biases or whatever it is. But I need a leader who doesn't allow their own persona, their own biases, their, all on, their own unconscious biases, whatever they show. Look, I, I'm a 50-something-year-old man who grew up in Puerto Rico. I have biases that were put into me from just the way I was raised. 
but I've had to learn to put those aside so that I can be more effective in how I operate across the globe. And, and I've, been, I've been blessed to work in, in, a comp- in companies that have allowed me to work literally in every corner and every region of the planet. And I've learned how to show up there and still be authentic to myself, but still also be able to interact effectively and not allow my biases to influence in a negative way the way I might interact from somebody who happens to be of a different background than I. So I want a culturally intelligent leader. I also want Spider-Man because Spider-Man has something no other superhero has and that's Spidey sense. And that allows him to really anticipate what's gonna happen next. You ever notice that every time something's gonna happen, he seems to move out of the way. He does that sort of, that move that we all wish we could do for the movies, right? Where he sees the bullet coming and he gets out of the way just in time. That's called spidey sense. That's anticipatory ability. And a leader, all of us, the more we can anticipate. In hockey terms, we talk about go where the puck's going, not where the puck, puck is at, right? Go where things are moving. Where's the market moving? Where's the where's the conditions moving? What's going on in the macroeconomics of the world? What's going on in my segment? What's going on in my industry? Where is it going? And I need leaders to be aware of that and to be the drivers of that and not to be a victim to that. Right? And I promise you, we're almost at the end of this of this list. But you got to know who the Hulk is, right? And of course, there's She-Hulk. Because the Hulk is a wonderful character. But before he's the Hulk, now, now Jenny, I'm going to test you on this one. Who is he before he's the Hulk? Do you know? Do you know, Jenny? I am before fully prepared with questions for you, but I am so ill prepared <laughs> for my superhero stuff. You guys help me out in the chat. <laughs> who was the so, Hulk? Somebody tell me who is the Hulk when he's not the Hulk. Somebody will know the answer to it. I'm looking for it. Bruce <laughs> Banner. Bruce Banner. Doctor. Dr. David Bruce Banner, doctor. He is the most soft-spoken, elegant, quiet, reserved, very educated doctor who, through his own experimentation, gave himself an overdose of radiation and becomes the Hulk when he gets what? You know this, Jenny. No, you know this. When does he become the Hulk? I do not (laughs) When he gets angry. When he gets angry, he becomes the Hulk, right? And so what comes out is this beast. Now, the Hulk is well-intentioned. If you ever watch any of the movies or read any of the cartoons or read any of the comic books or watch the cartoons, the Hulk is a very, well, he's this giant of a beast and he destroys everything, but he's always well-intentioned. He's always trying to do the right thing. He's always trying to beat the bad guy. But in the process, he destroys buildings and cars and all kinds of other stuff. He's the quintessential bull in the china shop. And he comes out when we're angry. And frankly, we don't want that in our leaders. We want emotionally intelligent leaders who really know how to control the beast and who can allow emotion to play out in them without losing control of their emotions and then acting out in beastly fashion. We don't need that in our leaders. We want emotion. I like emotion. I don't want to follow a blind leader. I like to follow somebody who gets passionate, maybe even gets angry. Heck, even gets angry sometimes for effect of nothing else but allows the emotion to be used and channeled properly and doesn't control the situation or allow them to create harm to the organization or to their followers or becomes just intolerant because of their emotions. We don't need that. And of course, this one always gets a nice little attention by some people in the audience. This is the ever famous Aquaman. Now what Aquaman can do more than any other superhero is that he can be amphibious. He can be on earth and he can be under the water. He controls the seas. He can talk. He can do all kinds of things, but he's adaptable more than anything else. He's adaptable. And I want a leader who is like Aquaman in that, in that they are adaptable. And then, of course, there's this famous character. I like this guy a lot. This is Wolverine. A Wolverine is a great superhero, strong as all get go, just has some amazing qualities. But the most significant thing he has that a leader needs to have is that he is able to heal himself and regenerate. He can heal himself and regenerate. When he gets hurt, he may take a fall back. He may be out for a few seconds, but then he heals himself and he gets back in the fight. And that's what I want of my leader. I want a leader who takes the hit, right? 
takes the few seconds that it takes to recover, and then re-engages, gets back in the game, pushes to the next milestone, and doesn't allow that to defeat them, and certainly doesn't allow that to defeat the organization. All right, so look, that was my quick way of giving you what I think are some really memorable traits that I hope you'll never forget because you can associate them with a superhero, but there are a couple of rude realities that I have to give you. Jenny hasn't seen this, and, and I'm going to throw them out there because at the end of the day, there are absolutely a couple of rude realities when it comes to leadership. Number one is bad leadership has consequences. Now, if you've been, if you've worked for someone that you consider not a great leader or manager, or if you yourself maybe have not always been the best leader or manager to your colleagues, you got to know there's an impact to that, and it's pretty significant. I've listed here four of them. The cultural impact to the culture of the organization cannot be overstated. Bad leaders create the wrong culture. The wrong culture creates the wrong results. The wrong results doesn't enable the shareholders to be happy with you if you're a publicly traded company. And it doesn't, it just, it's overall bad to the culture of the organization. The second, of course, is again, the poor results. Bad leadership typically ends up in bad results. Third, the stress that it causes the organization that leads to turnover. And in today's day and age, where talent is such a shortage of it, good talent is hard to find, right? And we have, we have so many people from so many different generations for the first time. We have people from their 20s all the way to their 70s working in companies side by side. Imagine the generational issues and the, and the gaps of that and how you operate in that environment and having a turnover in that environment can be negative to your organization. So clearly, that's my alarm telling me I'm almost at time to shut up. And then finally, the reputational damage that you can do to yourself and to your organization. Though that's rude reality number one. Rude reality number two, all leaders have weaknesses and flaws. There is no such thing. There are no such thing as perfect leaders. We all have flaws and weaknesses. This picture here, for those who are the geeks in the room and are wondering and saying, what's the picture of? That's a picture of a kryptonite. We all know kryptonite to be Superman's nemesis, right? It's what makes Superman weak. We all have something. And so what do we do, what do, we do with these weaknesses? And I, in one of my books, I address this directly. What are the cardinal sins of a leader? How do you deal with them when you make a mistake? What do you do with it? Well, here's four ideas. Number one, acknowledge the mistakes. Don't run away from them. Don't hide from them. Don't lie about them. Acknowledge them. Take full accountability for them. Second, learn from them. And then indicate to those that you're working with and around and those whom you are privileged to lead what you've learned from that mistake. I tell you what, there are very few of us who have who if some of our leaders, and we can all think about somebody right now in, in the political arena is easiest to think about because they're so visible, who if they had just got made a mistake and they had just come on and say, yeah, sorry, made a mistake. I really learned this about it and I really would like to move on. I wonder if we would just be a little bit more gentle and letting them have that second shot. I bet we would. I know I would. Third, evolve from the mistake, right? Because repeating it, well, that's a different problem. Repeating it is a different problem. And finally, lead humbly. Lead humbly. When you're in charge, you got to think about yourself in that servant leadership role. Your role is to lead individuals, motivate them, not to have them serve you. Quite the contrary. You're there to serve them. Right? And so I'll leave you with this last thought. I chose the word legacy for my title on the books, not by accident, not at all. It was very purposeful. And it's because I put an acronym to the word legacy. The L is for lead and love. Lead and love what you do. And if you don't, find something else to do that makes you happy. And Because if you're not happy, you're not going to make those around you happy. And, and after all, life's a bit too short for that. Two, the E is for empower yourself. No one can empower you. Empowerment is self-taken. The word itself says it. Empower. I empower myself. A manager who says I empower my people doesn't have a clue what the word means. No one can empower you. I can create an environment where you can be empowered, but you must acknowledge and accept that empowerment. 
If you want to just punch the clock and go home at the end of the day, nothing I can do about that. But I, if I create an environment where you can be creative, you can be, you can be innovative, and you want to do it, then you empower yourself. And you can do that for others as well. The G is forgive and grow. The more you do that, the more you grow, the more I get to do these kinds of presentations, I learn something each time from them. And it feels like I'm giving something back at the same time. The A is for your attitude. There are very few things we get to select on a daily basis. Every time you wake up, you put your feet on the ground, you get to choose what kind of day you're going to have that day. Start with a good attitude. I don't always do it, by the way. I try to, but I don't always do it. A C is for creating something of greater worth than yourself. That is the true purpose of leadership, to create something of greater and lasting worth than yourself. And the why is for you. You're, you're the only one that can do this. And, and as my friendly Spider-Man would say, it's entirely up to you. If you choose to do it, then you'll do it. If you choose not to do it, then you won't. So I thank you. I'm sorry I went four minutes over, Jenny. I wanted to leave 30 minutes for us to chat, but I wanted to go fast too, and I did that. I hope I engaged you and had fun with it. Now let's have uh, a bit of time now with, with a bit of Q&A. Ah, that was wonderful. I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. I was taking notes the whole time just to kind of uh, so hopefully, you know, enrich my experience and enrich your experience. And I want to talk a little bit more, Tony, about you coming up through the work world, right? You didn't start off in your career as, as being the head of something, or perhaps you did. How was it that you found yourself continually being hired and put in these positions of leadership? What was it uh, about you that, um, we know were, were I, you a leader I, always, or did you learn how to become a leader? Well, I, I, you know, so the, the eternal question, there's a couple of questions there. Let's unpack them all. There's the question of leader born or made. And I, I like to have fun with that one, and we won't take too much time on it. But I think it's a bit of both, right? You're born with certain qualities, but you're certainly are made through your education, through your experience, through the opportunities that you're, that you're given in life uh, and, and where you grew up and so forth, how your family nurtured you, how your church nurtured you, all that is a part of it. Um, I, I think I think uh, there's a couple of things that I would say to this audience about what most determines your success. One, hard work, right? Hard work and you're and earning a reputation for being results oriented and results minded. Because there are very few things, Jenny, that nobody can take away from us. People can talk about us, they can take all sorts of things away from us, they can say nasty things about us on LinkedIn, on, on, on social media, all that can happen. But what they cannot take away from you is your education. And I mean by that, both your formal and informal education. Become as smart as you can be. Become as smart, as educated as you can be. Read. Uh, go to school if, if it's available to you. But you don't have to go to school to be an educated person. So become an educated individual. And then in whatever you do, do it really, really, really well. The greatest measure and, and barometer of what's going to happen next for you is how well you're doing what you're doing now, the attitude with which you do that now. And for me, uh, you know, when I served in the Air Force, th there was something about serving in the military, serving the country and wearing a uniform that for me was very empowering and that I enjoyed doing it. My dad did it, so I wanted to do it. And it felt, it felt really good to me. But there, they really nurtured me. They really taught me. They really explained the principles and let me live them of putting people first. The troops always come first in the military. Every officer understands that. Any officer worked their way in anything understands that, right? And so for me, it was one focus on the results, being results-minded. How you get them is important. You can't get them with leaving dead bodies in the wake. But always get a reputation for being a results-minded individual who has a great attitude about the work that they do. And two, be as educated. And three, be open to the possibilities that you may not even know might exist for you. You mentioned the jobs that I had at j, &J. I did not plan those jobs. Fortunately for me, j, j is a company that does a fantastic job of moving people into roles they never thought they needed, they could have when they saw potential. If they see potential, if they see the ability to learn, if they see somebody who has a record of results, then they move you on to the next thing. So if you want the next thing, focus on the current thing. Educate yourself really, really well, and then stay open to when the opportunities show up so that you can step through the door. Oh, I really like that because so often we are so focused on 
just like the next step that we forget to excel and be incredible at the tasks that we're given. Um, Tony, we can't see you anymore. Do you see the little button on the bottom center that says start video? Yay! Here I am. Sorry. It was great to hear your words, but we want to see you as well. You've got such a fantastic setup and we want to see your expression. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're back. I want to hear some advice for, for, from you on something very specific that we are. I'm starting to hear a lot about and we're seeing I work in media and I've just been hearing some rumblings of this and I think it's very unfortunate. Um, Americans who have been in the work world for decades and have, you know, have a lot of experience and they find themselves at a position right now where they um, are looking for work. And what advice do you have for somebody who's trying to position themselves as an older American looking for work and their, their education was a long time ago, but they do have work experience. How do they come to leaders like yourself and explain the value that they bring despite the fact that they might not have graduated recently or or have the, the latest yeah. knowledge look it's a great question i would say to all of us uh, and i'm i'm now in that category of the older guy right i'm i'm closer to 60 than i am 50. so um you you can you you should not run away from that experience or feel like well my degree was I don't really care about your degree because there's no better schooling than life, right? So make sure that you have written a CV and, and created a LinkedIn profile that really demonstrates, write this word down, your differentiators, your differentiators. Find, you know, determine what you believe are your differentiators. What makes you uniquely special, uniquely qualified? What is your superpower, if you will, right? That, that that's and it's probably more than one not just one what are the things that you bring to the table right and that's what you're going to try to sell yourself on and and present yourself as right and and it's amazing i've had so many conversations coaching conversations with people at at different stages of their career and and they often we, we I don't know if it's because we're all tend to be more humble. Typically, more people are typically more humbly humble than they are arrogant, right? And they underestimate what their accomplishments are, or what they've done, or what it means. I've had one person tell me I don't really have an interesting story, and I said, "Really? Because I know you, and your story is a really interesting one." And then I told him his story. I actually told him his story. I said, "Wait a minute, you're the son." of a woman who lost her husband and you lost your dad when you were 11. Then you kind of grew up working. Your mom was sick. Then you had to work a little bit harder to take care of. I, what I hear is someone who doesn't quit, you know, and I gave him all, and all of a sudden I said, that's the person that I would want to hire. So don't tell me you don't have an interesting story. We have, you have an interesting story. So make sure you know what your differentiators are. Make sure your LinkedIn profile and your CV reflects that properly, really, because that's where we're going these days. LinkedIn has become the go-to place. So if your LinkedIn profile doesn't show you the way you should, shame on you. That's your that's your image. Make sure it's you. And then third, knock on every single virtual door that you can. The world is now your oyster. It used to be difficult to get to anybody. It's relatively easy now. Now, not everybody will answer. Not everybody will help, but some will. And you got to step your pride aside and do whatever it takes to be connected to the right people and don't be afraid to ask for help. If they say no, thanks for thanks for considering me. Move on until somebody does in fact take you on. But but it's they say finding a job and transitioning to a job is a full time job. And I believe that I've been there, done that. So I, I would say know your differentiators. Make sure your profile is what you want it to be. Make sure your social image and your professional image is what you want it to be, not what somebody else defines it as. And if you got to go fix it up and fix it up and be careful what you put on all the other postings, <laughs> because that's what we're looking for. And then just knock on every virtual door if you can. That's beautiful advice. It's such a great reminder. You guys, we all have a task as soon as we get off this call to go back and brush up on the LinkedIn and make sure that it's not a job from 10 years ago or something like that. Um, somebody else had a great question in the chat about re-entering the workforce. 
after COVID. So for, for example, perhaps somebody who experienced a layoff and has been, you know, home for a certain amount of time, they're ready to re-enter. What, what's the first best step? Well, I, I, I think it's the same ones, right? I think it's, I think it's again, what is it you're really going for? So be clear. Here's here's what I would tell you. And in one of the presentations that we talked about briefly, I do is a presentation called Lessons from the School of Hard Knocks. And in it, in it, I talk about the right ways and the wrong ways to network, right? So in the days, hopefully again, when we're back to being able to network in person, right? And be able to shake people's hand. Oftentimes people go to a networking event at a bar or some other event and they're holding holding a drink and they're having a conversation and and they're and they're networking oftentimes incorrectly i'll give you what i mean specifically sometimes somebody who may be very early in their career maybe they're just they're under 30 they're just sort of in their first or second job they're looking for that transition they're looking for that opportunity and oftentimes they make a very key mistake and i know because i made it too they look around in the room and they go, who is the most senior person in this room that I can network myself to? Who is the most important person in this room? Who's got the biggest title, right? And they go and they try to network with that person and that person may be gracious enough and have a conversation with them. And they might say, well, good, I, I now lead the company and I know the CEO of Coca-Cola. But between you and the CEO of Coca-Cola, there are about 18 levels. And guess what? That person is gonna move on in their career or retire long before you really need them. So the people you need to be networking with are not at the stratosphere necessarily. It's nice to know those people, but don't forget to network with the people who are in the positions you want in the next two or three to four to five years, who are at that director, VP, and uprising stars. Hit, hit yourself to them, network with them, mentor with them, grow with them so that your career. Now, if you're later on in your career, you go, okay, I've been there, done that. I've kind of left, rose my family. I want to get back into the workplace now. Go back to this idea of what are your differentiators. Don't consider the time down that you were out of the quote unquote workplace as a gap in my experience. No, you did other things in that period of time. Figure out what those things were. What did you learn in that experience? How would you position that in the workplace today? Right? If you became a, you know, a full-time mom for 10 years, uh, I know what, it's, what moms do and it's a full-time job. So don't underestimate what you can Say, listen, nobody can manage a household and multitask and, and do multiple complex tasks all at once better than a mom. And that's a job skill, multitasking, uh, low stress, you know, being able to manage big stressful situations. You focus on what you learn from the job, not necessarily what the job was. And tell me how those skills are going to translate and how they're going to serve me and my team and my organization now. I like how you explained that. And for people who are leaders who are on the chat, I think that it's important for the people in the hiring positions too, to look at those experiences and, and realize that everybody does bring value and, and listen to, you know, as, as people position themselves. I want to hear the biggest thing that you see that holds people back where maybe you see such potential in somebody and then maybe they get in their own way. What is it that keeps people from excelling to the highest heights of their career? I think there are two extremes. One is the not so great extreme, which is fear. Fear, right? They just say, I can't or I won't. Or It's, it's funny when you think about a, um, you know, a marathon or not a, mar a sprinter. Think about a sprint that's about to start a hundred yard dash. Here's what you never hear that sprinter say at the beginning of that hundred yard dash. I'm not going to win this race. They never go like this. I'm not going to win this race. No, they start with, I'm here to win this race, right? So they start with this very positive attitude. They're not afraid to engage. So fear, and by the way, happens to all of us, me too. Uh, there are many things that I've left undone in my life and in my career so far, primarily because I was maybe unwilling to take a chance. So that's why I admire entrepreneurs so much. For those who are on this call who are entrepreneurs, what entrepreneurs have that 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 is so special is, they just don't quit. They just don't quit. They might fail over and over again, but they will eventually hit it. And most entrepreneurs are absolutely, uh, have failed numerous times before they finally make it, but they never quit because they don't allow fear to get in the way. And then the other extreme of that is arrogance. And if you suffer from a little bit of that, and, and maybe arrogance is the wrong word, maybe it's ego, 
okay? But let not, not allowing yourself to be helped, not asking for help, not recognizing you may need help. And that may, may come in the form of literally asking somebody to help you, uh, asking for, for an opportunity, because that's what I like to do. I like to, I like to say, look, I know that I may not be the most qualified for the job that I'm talking to right now, but I promise you, if you take a chance on me, you ain't going to be sorry, and I'll show it to you, right? Ask for the opportunity, right? But don't be arrogant or egotistical or unwilling to ask for help. Seek the help. Take the help. And then, you know, allow that to enable you to get to the next level. I found it interesting where you, when you were talking about it was almost like a, a, a love of learning to to continually be a student. You're talking about things that, you know, I don't know if anybody was talking about emotional intelligence when you first entered the workforce, but I kind of suspect that's a newer thing, right? Or even cultural intelligence, you were talking about that. And when I hear you speak about that, you really light up. I think there could be a sense of we learn a skill, we do the thing, we go to the, to the job, and we kind of think we're going to slide on through. Um, what can you say to reinvigorate people who um, are, are not having that love of learning right now and would like to get there? Well, look, there, 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 if, you take, if, if you guys take nothing else away from this chat, because you, you said something really important, and maybe I, I sort of overlooked um, that this audience may not have the, the, the appreciation for what you just said around uh, uh, emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a concept that's been around in psychological terms for more than 100 years, but it was only introduced to corporate America maybe about 25, maybe years ago by Daniel Goldman in his book called Emotional Intelligence. And all of a sudden, all of us were being exposed to how to become more emotionally intelligent. And there's a way you can do that, right? So there's, a C, there's an IQ. We're all pretty familiar with that. Your IQ is your IQ, and kind of it's set. If you weren't born Einstein, you ain't never going to be Einstein. I'm sorry. It's, it is what it is. I cannot make you – I cannot help improve your IQ much. You can go to school. You can get smarter. You can learn. But you're not going to become a genius if you weren't kind of born one, right? That's not going to happen. So your IQ is one index of intelligence, but there are two others. So there's a total of three indices that psychologists use to describe our complete intelligence. And it's IQ, emotional intelligence, which is, again, this newer concept in corporate America that now is very common. And we often now measure leaders by their emotional intelligence, their ability to control themselves, understand their emotions, understand the emotions of others, and interact effectively across those differences. The third, which is, again, is it new in corporate America? I mean, I am one of the few people even talking about it in corporate America. There's a few books on it. My next book will be on cultural intelligence because they're just that few on it. But it's not a new idea. It's been around psychological academic circles for more than 50 years. So there's lots of ways to measure and to understand what cultural intelligence is and what yours is. There's a great assessment in the cultural intelligence assessment tool uh, that you can take for 60 bucks and it tells you where you are in the four indices of cultural intelligence. If, if a leader understands, if each of us, let alone leaders, but if you think about it, if I understand how to interact across emotional differences and cultural differences much more effectively, we would be having different conversations with each other. We wouldn't be speaking at each other or past each other. We really would be speaking with each other. We would be much more collaborative in our approach. Culturally intelligent and emotionally intelligent people are more able to do that. So if you want to really, really reinvent yourself, go out there and learn something about emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. Become better at those two things, and that will be a superpower differentiator for you, I promise you. We are so ready to be superpowers. We're so ready to have superpowers. <laughs> so that's great. I think that's excellent. Yeah, I haven't heard a lot of discussion around cultural intelligence. Another question came in, and I don't know if it was before or after you were touching on LinkedIn and how we need to kind of go and, and spruce up those profiles. And that's like a reminder for me. I just added you on LinkedIn and don't look at my profile yet. I don't know how to date. I've already done that. I've already done that. Dang it. Well, so so isn't that a good lesson? Because if I was applying for a job with you, I would think, oh, wait, that wasn't my best stuff. And somebody just said, how important is our LinkedIn profile when job searching? Like, Is that still the place to go? It is absolutely, it was imperative. And, and I can tell you that I do a lot of hiring still. Uh, I, I'm an advisor to a company and I there's not a senior executive 
or even some key positions that get hired in the company that I don't get to interview them for. Um, and so, and I've done a lot of hiring in my, in my career. I mean, a lot. And in the past, I'd say at least five, maybe 10, but certainly the last five years, there is not a person who I have a conversation with, like I did with you or like on a professional level where I have not gone to see their LinkedIn profile. Okay. And so you have to know that that is absolutely what HR and talent scouts are doing. They're going to LinkedIn. They're looking at your profile and they're evaluating your profile, your postings, what you say, what you don't say and all that. So it is imperative to have a fairly good presence on LinkedIn. We have homework assignments, everybody. Uh, what is what is next for you in your career? Uh, you, you've had an interesting, when, when I first read the bio, I thought, Tony is actually 200 years old. <laughs> you've accomplished so much, and I don't know when you did these books, but you did, so what's next? Um, I think I'm doing what's next, right? I mean, I, I think there's there's uh, several stages that I'm, things that I'm working on now. So I next is, is some more board service. I'm, I'm hoping that this stage of my career, now that I've sort of left the C-suite, and moved into more advisory roles, so I'm looking to, uh, to to find the right board of directors to sit on. Um, I've sat on on a few before, and I'm I'm looking for positions uh, on boards. Um, second, to continue to do this, to preach, to teach, to impart. I hope whatever I can um, to 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 leaders, individuals. So I do a fair amount of executive coaching with one on one with people, but I also do a lot of these kinds of presentations with audiences and trainings with organizations. So I'm doing a fair amount of that writing. I'll be, a, be doing a bit more writing uh, going forward. And then I sit on the advisory board of a company called Next Phase Capital, a private equity firm out of New York, doing uh, mergers and acquisitions work, uh, helping them in the healthcare segment to acquire companies. And so staying, staying quite busy. Sometimes I'm tempted and still believe one day I might end up going back to an operational role um while well, i still have the energy and the youthfulness to do it but uh but so far uh i've been staying busy with these other things you've had a fascinating career we just have a couple minutes but there's something that you touched on when we were chatting before this that i think is so important um you were talking about a time in your career when you i mean you're really killing it work-wise but you were traveling constantly racking up the miles like this badge of honor of travel and you said this has got to stop so talk about when you knew that you needed to make a change even though it sounds like financially you were doing really well well financially is doing really well thank god and and and, and that's 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 important i mean it enables my family and my children to do their education so it's i re i realize it's important um but the, but but it's got to be in balance and so I, I know it's easy to say this now uh, because, you know, people say, yeah, it's easy for you to say because you've kind of made it in your dare and so forth and so on. But but the reality is I've known some people now who have the courage to make sure they have that work balance, uh, family balance and work balance in place earlier on. Right. To make sure you're not chasing the wrong shiny object and just chasing the career and, and, and avoiding and forgetting some of the other things that might be important to you. So for me, it became you know, it was 350,000 miles a year, air miles, airplane miles, uh, all around the world. So the experience professionally, phenomenal. I wouldn't trade a minute of it. I mean, I've been to places of the world that, 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 that I never would have had a chance to be in or work in and enjoy and be a part of all on somebody else's dime. That's pretty cool. Right. Um, but it kept me away from, from the family for, long long periods of time and once i became a grandpa i didn't want to be that distant so that was one indicator for me uh that i was time to sort of come back to the us i was living in, in europe at the time and i wanted to come back to the us so that, that was so look for your indicator what's your indicator where maybe it's time to make sure that you're rebalancing things and uh he, i heard a good minister once say he's never seen a u-haul i mean a hertz pulling a u-haul right you can't take it with you so so whoever whoever dies with the most toys does not win <laughs> right that's why i wanted the word legacy in there because what do you want to be remembered for when you're gone because you will be remembered for something 
by whom it's up to you, your family, your children, your wife, your husband, your whomever is going to remember you for something. What do you want that something to be? Right? Would well, you want your tombstone to say successful businessman or successful businesswoman? I don't think so. I think you want it to say good man, good woman, good husband, good wife, good friend, loyal son, great dad. That's what you want. So if you want that, well, then you better act that way. Well, that is such a that's such a great point to wrap on. And I want to know, um, I'm sure people are now interested. Okay, how do how do I find you? We know LinkedIn. We know he's got a spiffed up LinkedIn profile. Uh, well, now that I said that, I'm gonna have to go back and make sure that it's actually <laughs> they're gonna go, really? That's the best he's got? Yeah, but I'm not looking for a job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Point. Very, very good point. Yes, that's the phase that you're in right now. But where can everybody find you? Find your books, l l learn more, etc. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put. I'm gonna put it right here in the chat if I can. Let me see if I can do that. So uh, you can go to my website, legacyleader.net. So that's one place people can. Oh, this should be .net, not .et. <laughs> Let me try that again. Legacyleader.net. I put it in too. There you go. So there's there's that, and then um, certainly on LinkedIn, if you if you if you friend me on LinkedIn, uh, send me a, a personal message. I guarantee you, most of those personal messages, unless they're sort of, you know, robocalls or or sort of trying to market market something. But if it's someone from this audience that says, "Hey, I listen to you talk," and and they want to connect, I I I will absolutely respond. You have been wonderful again. Tony Lopez, Anthony Lopez, thank you so much. I really appreciated the chat and I look forward to doing it again sometime. Um, and, and a lot of people in the chat are saying thank you. So just know that you are, are loved and appreciated today.